Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be exploring UFOs. We're going to look at the realities and the myths associated with them. My guest is Dr. John Alexander, a retired colonel in the U.S. Army and author of a number of books including The Warrior's Edge, Future Wars, and UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Realities. Welcome, John. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. You began uh, exploring UFOs seriously when you were in the military 30 years ago when you set up a, a working group called the Advanced Theoretical Physics Group. Is that right? That is correct. Now, I had been interested for much, much longer. I remember the first case was 1947, so I had a personal interest, but I finally got to a position where I said, you know, I think I've got the resources and we can make this happen. So we brought together people who were interested in the topic that you would not normally have access to. Mm -hmm. You yourself had uh, security clearance. Oh yes, uh, these all had top, uh, top uh, clearances. Uh, it was an old boy net, had to know who you were, had to be of interest. We had people from all of the services, from the intelligence community, and from a civilian aerospace industry that were all interested in the topic. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, you began with the working premise, which was pretty common in popular culture back then, that, uh, it, that the U.S. government, the military, may have actually uh, captured a crashed UFO. Uh, that was our starting point, that Roswell was real mm -hmm. uh, and that the military did it. And we also had a premise that we thought they probably wanted to release the information and that maybe we could assist in doing that. Mm -hmm. But over time we found something quite different. You basically found that uh, the phenomenon was uh, so complex, so mysterious, so confusing that uh, really uh, bureaucrats were uh, essentially befuddled by it. Well, there's, it's very interesting how we got to there. Now, I talked to, eventually, the most senior leaders of all of the intelligence agencies and, and that. And you found people who had a personal interest versus an institutional interest. Uh, in fact, I tell a story about the head of one of those three-letter agencies who said, A, we don't do that, and they would have to be involved, and then B, I'll tell you about the ones I personally saw. So he had no you know, personal qualms about mm -hmm. saying, you know, hey, I know there's something out there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you've also pointed out in your book that the uh, government of the United States, as well as other governments, acknowledge there is a real phenomenon going on. Oh yes, and the first line of my book is UFOs are real, and I mean that in the most physical sense. Mm -hmm. uh, now of course I end, as you kind of alluded to, whatever this is, it is far more complex than we ever imagined, or maybe than we could imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, in your first book, The Warrior's Edge, you explore the uh, range of uh, mental abilities and exotic talents associated, for example, with the martial arts. And and uh, shamanism and uh, various mystical traditions. You look at the potential application of those sorts of things in the military. And uh, since I know you as a friend, I know that you've traveled the world exploring uh, these kinds of phenomena uh, in, in great depth. In fact, you yourself are uh, something of a, uh, a folk icon in terms of uh, uh, being involved in, in these sorts of I exotic things. And the reason I bring all of this up is because, as I understand it, you, you now believe that if we're going to understand the UFO phenomenon, we have to look at it in this wider context, right. in, including interspecies communication, shamanism, higher states of consciousness, and so on. 
Right. Remote viewing. I did a lot of work with near-death uh, studies. Mm -hmm. I was once the uh, president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And it is my premise that somehow all of these phenomena are connected. One of the problems in looking at it is we tend to stovepipe. And I think in doing that, you cut off a lot of the information that would be helpful in understanding a theoretical basis, which mm -hmm. does not exist at this point. By th using the term stovepipe, I think you mean trying to see it as a single discipline rather Correct. than an yeah. interdisciplinary approach. Uh, very, very much so. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you look at near-death experience, poltergeist, remote viewing, UFOs, and they cut off access of the information in between. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a mistake. Well, as someone with a background in parapsychology, I know that many parapsychologists, uh, even though they understand that parapsychological phenomena are associated with UFOs often feel that there's too much political social pressure on them just doing the narrow work they want to do right. and to try and handle several uh, areas of the paranormal at once uh, yeah. becomes overwhelming. That's why I get back to in my view that what we're looking at is something that is terribly complex mm -hmm. and there is not a single simple answer for any of these or you know looking at them in isolation mm -hmm. I really think and I've asked for a step back phenomenon where we look at the observations and then do a macro pattern analysis on mm -hmm. that and yeah. say okay what are the patterns that come up and I do believe that consciousness is going to be a key piece of that. Mm -hmm. Well as a military man I'm sure you paid particular attention to a number of cases I should think at least a half dozen very well established cases where it seems as if UFO activities uh, have uh, been associated with and sometimes interfered with uh, nuclear missile systems. That is correct. There's a very famous case at Malmstrom Air Force Base uh, in which we had two uh, squadrons out there that had a substantial number of missiles come down simultaneously, something that never happened. You, when you say come down, you mean this malfunction? Off. Yeah, well, they came offline. They Off could line. not have been launched mm -hmm. at, at that point. Yeah. Uh, one of the wings was out 10 for 10, another one was six or seven missiles down simultaneously. Simultaneously, uh, there's a, a uh, logistical context called uh, mean time between failure. I mean, you know how often things are going to fail. You would expect um, maybe two of these a year, mm -hmm. and yet at this time you had 16 or 17 down simultaneously. And this was in what we call the nuclear triad. These are strategic systems. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this was in the bad old days, going to go to war with the Soviet Union. And you needed to know, you know, if you push the button, that everything is going to work. Mm -hmm. And it would not have at that time. W and were UFO sightings associated with this? Uh, there were. Uh, there was in, in one of the silos, uh, there's a guy by the name Bob, Bob Salas who was down below. Now the problem here is you had the launch control officers who were down below. You had on top of the surface, uh, you had security police. And they were the ones who were making the observation and calling back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, Salas had acknowledged that, but then as the missiles came offline, he said, did not have time because they were in crisis mode down below. Mm -hmm. But there definitely was a relationship between UFOs being seen and the missiles coming offline. And I understand similar events were reported in the Soviet Union. Oh, there's a huge event that uh, happened in the Soviet Union. Uh, George Knapp is the key guy who brought back the information, but this was a little bit different. Uh, in that they had a very large UFO hovering over the base for hours, seen by hundreds of people. Instead of coming offline, they started spinning up, meaning they were about to launch, which scared the hell out of the launch control officers because they couldn't control it. Mm -hmm. And their thoughts were, my God, we're about to start World War III, and it's beyond our control as it got further along and suddenly it shut off as well but not because of the actions of the uh, missile control officers. Mm -hmm. Well 
these examples would lend one to think that we're dealing with aliens from another planet who are interfering with our nuclear whistle missiles in, in order to warn us about a potential mm -hmm. catastrophe. We, well, there are books. Uh, uh, Bob Hastings has written a whole book on nukes mm -hmm. and you know the nuclear cases and UFOs. Yeah. The problem is uh, when you look at these uh, as we do now in isolation, we, we mm -hmm. put them together and say, yeah. "Wow, look at all of these things that's happened." When I separate that over a world and more than half a century, really very very isolated events. Mm -hmm. Not that they were ignored. I mean, people did study them, uh, you know, to an extreme degree. The problem was, it came up with a, to have no idea what this is. Mm -hmm. Then you end up with a case of, okay, how, uh, resource management, how much uh, time, material, money are you going to put into researching something you're probably not going to get an answer to. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, in spite of cases like that that, that would seem to have uh, enormous implications for national security, at some point the government, to your understanding, actually officially sort of threw up its hands and said there's no reason to study this any further. Oh, we do many of those things. It's called the too tough to handle bin. Mm -hmm. And there are a host of topics uh, that are in there. And again, it's a resource management. How, how much time, money, effort are you going to put in to things that are very, very rare? The case with Malmstrom, what they said finally, I mean, they looked at it extensively and looked for electromagnetic pulse and a host of, you know, potential uh, causes. Maelstrom being the U.S. That, case. That, that's the missile case that yeah. I, I mentioned earlier. And they said, you know, have no idea what did this kind of, if, if it happens again, we'll get really serious. Mm -hmm. But it, again, these are isolated incidences. Right. Now, I know you um, are associated with Jacques Vallée, the French UFO researcher. Well, right. he's lived in the United States now for uh, many decades, uh, someone I've interviewed as well. He has a, a unique hypothesis involving UFOs and one uh, that I think you're quite sympathetic to. Yeah, and he did the foreword uh, to my book. Mm -hmm. and yeah, our, our philosophical position on it is very, very similar. And I think it comes down the same way he did, you know, Passport to Magonia. And it's, it's a, this is terribly complex and it doesn't fit any simple solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, as I understand it, Jacques Vallée goes a bit further. Um, do you agree with him when he suggests it's a control system of some type, that, that somebody yeah. is somewhere, some conscious entity somewhere is pulling levers, attempting yeah. to manipulate the human race in some way through these mysterious phenomena, probably at a subconscious level. Well, I'll go back. This is where I think we need to look in the broader context, mm -hmm. because this occurs in all of these phenomena. As you know, in the book, I pointed out something what I call the precognitive sentient phenomena. Yeah. And this is based on some things we did, and quote, Skinwalker Ranch, if you will, where very, very strange incidents happen. Mm -hmm. And the trickster is known throughout history. In uh, all mythology. Yeah, throughout mythology that says, you know, there's somebody kind of screwing with us. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a control mechanism? Don't know. Yeah. But uh, what it was, uh, I found was that there was something out there that was looking, I say, precognitive. It knew how we were going to respond to a certain incident before the incident occurred. Mm -hmm. It was certainly smart or sentient and absolutely in control. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example, say, from the Skinwalker Ranch study? Oh, Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, there are so many examples there. Uh, you know, the book by Colm Kelleher mm -hmm. and uh, George Knapp on it. Um, uh, the Skinwalker Ranch was owned by Robert Bigelow. A number of us were up there, it was monitored 24-7. Um, I'll give you one example that just defies total description. We had instrumented the ranch. Mm -hmm. We had cameras up there that were facing in certain uh, directions. The particular incident uh, involved here is I have camera one that happens to be looking at camera two, both looking out and the wires come down back to the base where everything's being recorded. Um, <clears throat> at a time that we know, suddenly uh, these cameras are about 20 feet high, 
something pulled the wire uh, mm -hmm. out of the camera. There was about half a roll of duct tape mm -hmm. around the post uh, holding up. That's totally gone. There's about a three foot chunk of wire that's totally missing. There's PVC down at the bottom that's been pulled loose mm -hmm. and missing. And as it turns out that at the time of the incident, which we know because you had the daytime recording back at the cabin, um, the cattle happened to be milling right around that pole. Mm -hmm. The uh, reason that's significant is we know that if anybody got close to the pole, they would be spooked mm -hmm. and you know scatter. Yeah. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So you have an a uh, incident that happened absolutely you know, in physical reality, uh, should have been captured on camera, and wasn't. The cameras, as I recall, were taking slow motion snapshots once every second or so. Uh, second or third. Mm -hmm. and, and so you have one picture where everything is intact, and the next picture where all the damage has already taken well, place. Well, you, you don't see the damage from the camera, uh -huh. uh, but what you do know is that the camera, out, you know, the outlying camera, stopped recording, so mm -hmm. you know when that was. Mm -hmm. But then you go in and you look at the physical damage that was done, uh, just no plausible explanation. Mm. Okay, so that's one example, and uh, it's well, there a are a host of those. And, and one of the points is, mm -hmm. you know, these things would happen. You point the cameras out, and it, whatever it is, control says, "Oh, you like that," mm -hmm. and it would do something just off camera. Yeah. So every time we tried to set up to mm -hmm. understand the phenomena, or you had something presented, and you responded to it it would change slightly, and yeah. that's the trickster component. And in this case, associated with poltergeist-type phenomenon, cattle mutilation-type yeah. phenomenon, yeah. which you're suggesting are also related to UFOs. I, in some way, mm -hmm. yes. There'd be a host of phenomena. Yeah. And again, the trickster, the control mm -hmm. mechanism, this is where Jacques and I pretty much agree. There is something out there. Yeah. Now, we, we need to talk about some of the myths, okay. uh, and in particular, a uh, very well-publicized myth by an associate uh, uh, of yours, uh, Phil Corso, who, who wrote a book in which he claims that he was involved in uh, the Roswell incident right. and uh, alien technology was retrieved and he was involved in... Uh, Disseminating information. This, this is sometime later. Yeah. This is, um, it's, that was 47, mm -hmm. he's talking about 1960. That they're Transferring to. alien technology to uh, U.S. corporations. Correct. Uh, it's a very popular book, and, and so as a, as a result of that book and others like it, many people believe that the U.S. government has some sort of a treaty even yeah. with alien <laughs> intelligences from other planets. Well, well that's another leap, but yeah, yeah there are people that were, were trading technology for humans. Mm -hmm. And what's your response? Well, my response, uh, now Phil was a personal friend, mm -hmm. I really liked him. And, and um, a person who seemed to be completely credible. Oh, yes. Um, but when the book came out, I wrote him a letter that was seven pages at the time, it's an appendix in my book, yes. that said, here are the errors. And it started with little things like it's Adelphi, Maryland, not Adelphia, as mm -hmm. he had, to yeah. No, the Cold War was not a cover for fighting E.T which he and, and others have said yeah. is totally preposterous. More specifically, with the technologies, the inference was that somehow they were going to inject technology as we moved along, and it would help advance our uh, industrial efforts. Mm -hmm. um, integrated circuitry, night vision, uh, fiber optics were specific examples. The problem is when you go back and you check the uh, history of the development of these technologies, you do not see a sudden leap where we, a big advantage uh, was you know, gained by the, quote, alien technology. I'm very familiar with the night vision because the guy who physically built night vision lab was a personal friend and we'd worked with him and very open to phenomena. We'd actually done PK parties uh, with him. The Psychokinesis. Metal, metal bending. Metal yeah. bending parties. So, yeah. so he was open to phenomena. Yeah. Uh, but the description in the book as to how night vision uh, evolved is just totally wrong. Mm -hmm. 
So you've got a situation here where a, a, a person with, with a stellar career in the military uh, comes out with a story like this, a person who's been a friend of yours, someone who seems absolutely sincere, and when you talk to him, he seems convinced that it's absolutely. real. But when you fact check his story, yeah. it's, it's very clear that uh, it's preposterous. It, it does not accord with the facts. The, um, the title of that chapter is called The Corso Conundrum. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out, uh, coincidentally, that I was with Phil within two weeks of his death. What yeah. happened is he had a major heart attack, had recovered. I was down in the area for my son's wedding. We went up and spent the day with him. And one of the things he told me is, gee, I, I really need to do another book to correct the errors that mm -hmm. are in the first one. And he was working on it. He yeah. actually, so, no, Phil was not computer literate, so a lot of this was handwritten and yeah. all that. And unfortunately, he had the second heart attack that mm -hmm. proved fatal just a few days later. But even if he acknowledged there were errors, I get the impression from you that he wasn't going to retract the whole substance no. of his no. story. It, like I say, that's why I call it the conundrum, mm -hmm. because you do have somebody who is who he says he was. He was in the places that he said he was. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a interesting relationship with a General Trudeau, who was legendary in uh, military intervention. They are actually involved in something called Project Horizon which was how would we fight from the moon mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't realize the army ballistic missile defense which was in existence at that time really was the precursor to the Apollo mission and mm -hmm. were you know integrally involved in getting us to the moon mm -hmm. um, they were doing a lot of it very advanced things the problem again is when you do the fact checking um, it just does not hold up. Mm -hmm. But now it's fair to say that there's, I guess you could call it a cult, or a small percentage of the population, but still thousands of people I, who, who accept these things as literally true, and when they hear you, amongst other people, saying, no, it's not, I've looked yeah. into it, it can't be real, yeah. they say, well, you're part of the cover-up yourself. Well, that's it. In, in my slides, as you know, one of the things I say, if you're going to join, you need three things. Mm -hmm. Um, one of them, you better have you know some thick skin. You're going to get attacked. Uh, you better have day job because you're not going to make a lot of money. And the other is you must understand conspiracy theory because either you believe there's a conspiracy, or if you don't, then you therefore become part of the cover up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the problem is, in my view, that the true believers are just as bad as the skeptics and debunkers. Mm -hmm. uh, they will believe anything. One of my pat phrases is there are no lower limits. Mm -hmm. You can come up with the most bizarre story that is, you know, demonstrably false and you'll find people who adamantly believe it. Well, it seems as if it's a unique psychological phenomenon, not so much the wackadoodle people mm -hmm. out there who might believe anything, but when you have highly credible people in every other regard in their mm -hmm. life who are still espousing stories that uh, you know from fact-checking that uh, cannot be true, that you've got a, uh, a very unique psychological syndrome. And it's called paraphrenia, mm -hmm. and it uh, has been explored and is included in some DSM, um, and it, it does exactly what you're describing. DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Correct. And And the point is that uh, they say there are these people who, as, as you described, are perfectly logical, functional uh, throughout their life, and you have a niche. Was it crazy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's kind of no other way to put it. Well, I suppose that's part of the human condition that yeah, we have to I appreciate. So, yes. And uh, just as perhaps UFOs are essentially an expression of the human condition. Quite possibly. One of the things we didn't mention at the beginning is, and, and I address it, what is a UFO? Mm -hmm. Because you do have little balls of light that maneuver around. We've got craft more than a mile across that are hard, seen by many, many people, thousands, sensor systems. 
and everything in between. Mm -hmm. One of the things that bothers me is this extensive variability yeah. in the kinds of craft that are supposedly being seen. Mm -hmm. They do things you would expect, and you do see them on sensor systems. Conversely, uh, there are things you don't expect and for instance, hard craft that are there that are people are making observation of, and your sensor systems do not pick them up when they should. Well, you know, of course, that I've written a book uh, okay. in which I personally was involved in some research uh, in, in which it appeared that a, a UFO sighting seen by hundreds of people was, was created through some sort of a psychokinetic or telepathic yeah. process. Well, this is why I get back to, yeah. you know, the, the core to this, I believe, is consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you're familiar with the Philip group where they did other kinds of phenomena that were intentionally being brought about out, you know, by groups of yes. people. That's a very interesting uh, story, and it, it may uh, hit at sort of the core of this. The Philip Group was in Toronto many uh, years ago, and they uh, got together and held seances in the style of the 19th century seances. They produced this kind of phenomenon that uh, occurred at that time, table levitations and rapping and so on, with a whole story about a ghost named Philip, but it was all made up. It well, was contrived. Uh, the intent was made up. The phenomenon but the point was real. The phenomenon is real. Yeah. It's, it's quite unusual, and it certainly suggests the interplay between uh, the human psyche, which is really the last great frontier, and uh, phenomenon of this well, sort. Well, I, I do mention, when you look at UFOs and the, the history, uh, you find early on you, uh, very different descriptions. Yeah. Uh, Jacques Belay, you mentioned, had one where um, early... You know, I'm going to cut you off, though, John, because okay. we're, out of, we're out of time now, but I know what you're saying saying is that we need to look at uh, mythology and stories, the, the ethno-historical uh, literature in all cultures. John Alexander, thank you so much for being with me. Uh, you're welcome. And thank you for being with us.